um, national tour, which was a few years later, she really wanted us to keep all of her work here. And the reason she wanted that, I think, is so that she'd have more room at home to make more <laughs> art. But the only piece, the only thing she took back, and it was gigantic, was um, Sydney's memorial, because she intended to work on that some more. And it was with her um, in, until the present. So I think that had a great deal of meaning to her. The other piece that's on view, and all those portraits are in view in the form. I hope you'll get a chance to see them. This one is in Gallery 3. It's called, um, our gallery is called Distinctively Columbus, and it features art that is really special um, here for the Columbus Museum of Art. So it features the work of Elijah Pierce and George Bellows, who both lived or were born here. Um, the Photo League collection, of which is a wonderful collection of photography that we have at the museum, and then the work of Amina. And this, in fact, is called the Sa Sapelo Island Community Quilt. But Amina told me that this is a Raganon, too. So this, and the reason it's a Raganon is that it took her a very long time to do. She worked on it a long time, and it's very much layered. It has music boxes. It has um, those um, kind of puffy people that she would stuff and that um, were really the spirits of all kinds of people to her. Uh, and this is actually a portrait of her mother that she hooked. She actually um, spun the wool herself, dyed it, and developed her own little tool to hook this section. And it, she said it took her five years to do just that portion. Now, not constantly, but pro perhaps um, off and on. And then she said, and you can read, that the, the faces of the quilt are not only the faces of my mother and my grandmothers, but also the faces of the um, Hog ha Hammock community, all the women that lived there. Hog Hammock was a little area of Sapelo Island. So after the Emancipation Proclamation, the um, state of Georgia actually owned most of Sapelo Island, but they gave this little community, Hog Hammock, um, to a group of freed slaves. And um, Amina, so Amina found this all out by those interviews she did with her aunt, and she became fascinated and did a lot of research about Sapelo. She visited there at least three times. Once she went with Sydney, looking for documentation about um, her great aunt. She never found anything for sure, but she knew she had been there, and that meant a lot to her. So that became um, very, very important, and she did many different kinds of art. Um, documenting Sapelo. There's a kind of grass that grows there, sweet grass, and the, w usually the women make these beautiful baskets. So this is a three-dimensional figure that has the hog mog, um, but it's called the basket maker. And this is kind of a, um, an old photograph of one of the women making a basket. So this piece, again, is one of those Raganons. It's, um, it doesn't have right angles, but it is um, quite magnificent, very heavy. It has music boxes embedded in it. And uh, make sure you get a chance to go up and, and see it. And this is Amina always had a Raganon going. So she might be doing um, watercolors or rag paintings or drawings, but she'd always have a Raganon going in the living room. It always took a lot of space. And she would never see it. She would keep it rolled up, and she wouldn't know what it looked like. In fact, on a number of occasions, we would bring the Raganon um, that she had going to the museum so she could see how big it was. Um, it, it, did, it, it takes a certain kind of space to display these, as you can imagine. But she always was working on them. And this is one that we actually had this piece in symphonic poem. It hung in what was our grand staircase, which is um, now part of our, going to be part of our new building. Um, it was, I believe it was 23 feet high and 15 feet wide, and that was only half of it. So we hung it, and, um, and you can see what she said about this. This is really about so many things. It's about her own journeys. It's about the journeys of her ancestors. It's about Africa before slavery. It's about the great my, um, the, the slavery and migration. And even this one um, was uh, after 9-11. She actually added the Twin Towers to it as well. And then after that exhibition, um, the National Underground Railroad purchased this um, Raganon, and they, in their multi-story um, entranceway, are, were able to hang both parts of it. 
and it is still there today, and it is quite magnificent. But there are, um, again, she loved doing research, so there's a part in here about the fact that in 1804, Ohio um, instituted laws that made it illegal to help uh, escape slaves. Things like that. There's a lot of history in this one, and a lot about her trips to um, to Israel, to New York, her um, residency at um, PS1 in Queens. Uh, there's one, oh, here's Birthing on the Sea Train. Some of you might remember this story. You know, she loved riding the subways when she was in New York. She really didn't care where she went, but she just loved to ride the subways. And lo and behold, one day on the sea train, a woman went into labor and actually had a baby. And the baby, as Amina tells it, turned blue but survived and was, was fine. And Amina did um, a very large piece about that called Birthing on the Sea Train. This is another ragging on. So when she would travel, she would come back. And um, you know, she always had these beautiful journals and sketchbooks with her. And then she would create paintings and rag paintings, and often a ragging on. So this one we also had in symphonic poem. It's about 50 feet long. And they're not, they're not two-dimensional. They have sculpture. They have books within books. Um, they are really um, a challenge to display, but they're so interesting. This is um, from a more recent exhibition called um, Life Along Water Street. So Uncle Alvin told Amina that there was this kind of um, very active community of African Americans along the river here in Columbus before the flood of 1913. After that, um, they, everyone who lived there moved further east. But he believed that this was a very old um, community and that originally, like, hundreds of years ago. It had been inhabited um, by Africans who came before slavery, Native Americans. Again, just these layers of civilization. So Amina um, did a whole series of work about um, uh, Water Street, which is now like Marconi Boulevard um, today. And she did another Ragganon that again went all the way around the gallery. It was quite wonderful. This um, type of work that she did, she called rag paintings. And she really, I think this is one of her strongest um, types of art. She would use fabric the way other artists might use paint. And she would um, you know, cut it, she would arrange it, and then combine it with these beautiful um, drawings of the details of people's faces and hands. And Elijah Pierce was a very good friend of hers and a mentor. I mean, the 19, she met him in the 1970s, first at his, uh, he had an exhibition at the Y, actually. But then she says she met him formally when Ursel White Lewis introduced her to um, Elijah Pierce at Elijah Pierce's barbershop, which was just around the corner from the museum. And in this piece, which is called Shop Talk, um, this is Mr. Pierce, and this is Ursel White Lewis, who is really one of the first African American um, arts patrons here in Columbus. And she really took a liking to Amina and her work. And Mrs. Lewis would actually have, um, she would have fashion shows, and she'd have the models hold some of um, Amina's work when Amina was quite young, as they um, actually were showing their, their fashions. She also worked as a receptionist at the White Funeral Home. And Amina used to go there as a young girl, and they would let her go in, and actually she wanted to draw from the bodies. So early on, she was educating herself of how to be an artist. But she became very close with Mr. Pierce in the 1970s, and this was a very hard time for Amina. Um, her finances were really very low. Um, she had separated from her husband. She found herself as a single mother. And at one point, she actually had to go on welfare, which was something she just um, really didn't want to do and um, really, really bothered her. Um, but that's when she became very close with Mr. Pierce. They also lived near one another, so they would take long walks together. And he very much um, just encouraged her to go on, both just um, you know, that these hard times would pass and also encouraged her in her work as an artist. So they were very, very close, and she depicted him in many, many um, different ways. Um, this is the painting that we have in the forum. These are the three-dimensional pieces. And then she did a ragging on, 
probably one of her smallest raganons, um, which is quite wonderful. It's of um, Mr. Pierce cutting hair in the barber shop and then talking to a group of children over here. And again, it has lots of music boxes and found objects. This is the, um, a very bad um, image of the work that's in Page Turner's uh, award-winning picture book art from the Maza Museum. This piece is actually not from the Maza Museum. It was from um, Amina's collection. But um, that was a very important book for her that she really um, loved illustrating. And then also in the form is um, just a wonderful drawing that you see here. Um, in 1979, uh, Kojo Kamau and Mary Ann Williams helped Amina go, actually helped her raise money so that she could go on a study tour of Africa in 1979. She was there for six weeks. And um, it was really a pivotal, mom pivotal moment in her life, and I think affected everything she did since. But um, just to play on the theme that art supplies are everywhere, so she brought a lot with her. Um, most of us would pack clothes. She packed the minimal, and she brought lots of drawing papers that she made herself and other materials. But she ran out at some point. So at that point, she actually used the um, shelf paper that lined the drawers of the um, bureau in the hotel. And that's what this drawing is on. She also went to Gore Island. And I think that greatly affected her. This was one of the points from which um, um, Africans were made to, um, were treated so horribly and um, were shipped across on the Middle Passage. And I think, oh yeah, I do have the quote. Um, Amina said, this is the history of the Africans sold into slavery and taken to America during the Middle Passage. Gore Island is where the door of no return is. Once you go through that door, there is, there is no return. The slaves were kept in little slave houses. It was very heart-wrenching to feel and to hear and to see that. Once you have experienced it, you'll never forget it. I heard my ancestors. I could feel them. I could smell them. I wanted to bring that to this piece. So I think that was really important. And that trip to Africa is also where she got the name Amina. She um, received that name from a holy man in Egypt. And she always said she never changed her given name, which she was very proud of. But she legally had Amina appended to her other names to become Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson. And um, as I said, I think that trip really greatly affected her, as did um, her long conversations with um, her great aunt, Themba. And so then she got the opportunity um, to do a book called To Be a Drum that was written by Evelyn Coleman, who's an author in Atlanta. And again, it's a picture book that tells the history very, in very few words. It tells the history of African Americans. And Amina, um, I can still remember when she got the letter about this, she was overwhelmed. She just thought that this was something, that there was some reason she was asked to do this, because she could incorporate all of that knowledge that she had from her trip to Africa, um, the thoughts about her um, great aunt, um, Africans before slavery, you know, then slavery and their migration. And that this was the person, perfect vehicle to do it. So even, and, and what's so wonderful is that Amina wrote her own, um, her own book that, of course, wasn't published, but that she had to accompany the work that she did. And she used the media of those rag drawings that we saw earlier, but she also incorporated lots of found objects. And she also incorporated some of that quilt um, that she had from Themba. So this is um, you know, the, the horrible trip during the Middle Passage. This is actually um, a slave auction. Uh, th these are only five examples. We have all of them. There are 16 of them, but we didn't have enough room. These, she carefully um, researched what African Americans wore, the uniforms they wore in all the American wars in which they played a part. So you see that here. Uh, and then this page, it says something like, African Americans are entertainers. But she depicted individuals. It doesn't say this in the book, but this is um, Miles Davis as a young man and an older man, and Charlie Parker and Ella Fitzgerald. And then she decorated the stage that they're on with lots of buttons. She said she did this piece, which is the frontispiece in a circle, to indicate how, everyone, the, how everyone's connected and how we're all one large community.
and it's really quite, um, quite beautiful. And then also in the form are these um, sketches she did for this wonderful piece called um, My Lord, What a Morning. So um, in 19, this was in 1994, Claudia Gold, who was a curator at the Wexner, organized an exhibition where she invited 17 artists to submit pieces that um, would have in them music box workings. And the music box workings were, or the music was sent to Switzerland to the, a very well-known um, music box company to make the actual um, uh, music box workings. And so Amina actually did write some music, but they had trouble transposing it, so they let her use the, um, the spiritual, my lord, what a morning. And then actually she um, found, actually, Carl Solway, who was um, uh, a pers the gallery owner in Cincinnati that represented some of her work, came across these old organ pipes. And he gave her the idea that these would be great to work with. And of course, she was taken with those because anything that had been used for something else, I think, meant a lot to Amina. She would go to garage sales and you know, get furniture and turn it into other things. So this was really um, something that she thought was terrific. And what she did is she um, turned each of these into a woman so that together, together they make a chorus. And um, they're decorated with iron pieces, again, found objects. But they're to, um, to connect with the um, ironwork that slaves were made to um, construct on plantations in the South. So there's a lot of meaning to these. And then the, the music boxes were made and each is in each one of these pipes. So when they're all played together, it's quite magnificent. But um, these are the drawings she did for those. And you can see early on how her concept was to make each one of those pipes um, the figure of a woman. And there you have the ironworks that became kind of crowns for the women, but also relate back to slavery. And then um, when Symphonic Poem went on a national tour to Brooklyn, it was, we knew about that for maybe a year or two before. So Amina started doing research about Brooklyn. And she did a whole ser series of woodcuts. Um, I think there are 11 of them. And they're huge. And they're very striking. We have two of them in the form. And they're all about Brooklyn. Woodcuts became another um, media for her. And almost every series she did, actually, she did at least one of these a year. When she had been in a residency in New York, um, she went to a printmaking workshop and um, made a lot of connections. So she would do these woodcuts and then send them to New York to be printed. And th these are some examples of other ones that she did. Um, many animals, the stories of Uncle Alvin. And these are the two from um, that Brooklyn series that are very striking. And then I wanted to end with um, not a work of art, but really with um, a celebration of Amina, because you know, um, um, many of you here today probably, I, I don't doubt, have memories of Amina and she's talking to you and you have stories that you could probably share with us. Amina was a very private person and she liked to work, you know, almost 24 hours. And many days she wouldn't answer the phone or if you knocked on her door she wouldn't answer it. But she really was a people person. And when she got out, she, it was hard to get her away. Sometimes the museum would be closing, and she'd still be talking to people. Um, she'd be signing books or at an exhibition um, reception. Or many, many people, when they were young, would take workshops with her, either in the schools or at the recreation and parks where she worked for 19 years. So um, she made many, many, many um, connections. And she encouraged thousands of individuals and audiences here in Columbus and in Brooklyn and in Chile and in um, Israel to research their own heritages and document them however they could, maybe in music, in dance, in film, 